new favorite episode. <laughs> wait, wait, which one? Uh, Final Frontier? Uh, of course. <laughs> well, one of the great things about showing both these episodes is that um, it shows the tonal range mm -hmm. that Castle can accommodate. We can be serious one week and really funny the next week, and um, we really love that about the show. Where a lot of shows, you're in for the same experience every week. We like to keep our fans on our toes, on their toes, and we also, uh, it's a way for us not to get bored when we're writing the episodes. Mm -hmm. I also think this show is such a really nice, these two episodes in particular show such a nice range of how the show, I mean, it is a straightforward procedural in some sense. I mean, it is a sort of murder of the week. And yet it has these amazing serialized elements that, that sort of run through the season. So how do you balance that when you're thinking about sort of writing seasonal arcs or episode arcs? I mean, these two episodes back to back really show, as you mentioned, the tonal range of the show, but they also show just how, di you know, how diverse it can be as a show, I think. Um, well, when we um, start the beginning of the season, we always take a look at... <laughs> no, 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 okay, I hear, I hear, I hear. We always take a look at what, uh, what the characters are going to do over the course of the season. You know, for instance, last season we knew it was going to be a season of secrets, mm -hmm. so that was something that we were playing with, and we found some hallmarks um, throughout the that particular year that we knew we wanted to hit. Um, this year we know we're playing with a relationship and the fun mm -hmm. of a relationship. Uh, what we're in the midst of is settling into the honeymoon period between the two of them. I don't trust you. No, I don't. <laughs> um, and, and we know that we need to complicate the relationship mm -hmm. moving forward uh, and, and test it a little bit. But we've had... Um, we've had <laughs> <laughs> we've had a great deal of fun along the way. But it's, it, it's knowing where you're, you're going to go and then course correcting along the way. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about different kinds of directions, different kinds of tensions? Obviously this season, these two episodes are really different in the tensions they create, but both based around the, the Castle Beckett relationship. What kinds of uh, ways are you, new, new ways you need to explore? Well, um... If we told you, you wouldn't watch. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd still watch. I, I, bet, I bet these guys would. They would, okay. <laughs> So what are we going to do this this season, the rest of the season, Andrew? I don't, I don't know, son. Why don't, why don't you take this one? <laughs> well, I mean, what do you think? We've still got, we're still kind of in the honeymoon phase. Yeah, we, we kind of are. And I yeah. think we have a couple more episodes of that. Uh, and then the normal uh, stress and strains of a relationship will come in. But, you know, in a fun first way. First year of a first yeah, year relationship. Of a first year yeah. relationship. Um, in, in, in a really fun and interesting way. You know, we, we have an episode coming up where it's a... Uh, we have a meet the parents scene where Martha and Jim and uh, <laughs> you know they're all at dinner together and it doesn't quite go the way Castle and Beckett want it to. Um, and in the midst of it, they're called off to a murder, which leads them to a witness. And um, while they're getting this witness, a couple bad guys show up who want the witness dead and. Uh, Castle and Beckett lose their phones. Beckett loses they lose their everything. They lose everything. <laughs> so basically, they're on the run in a bad part of town in the middle of the night with no way to communicate, no way to get back. And they're bickering because, you know, their parents just, they didn't and get along. And it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's my mom's fault. It was clearly your dad's fault. My dad is perfect. <laughs> But, you know, anybody who's been in a relationship and has had those awkward dinners, you know, hopefully they can relate. And it's really hard when you have to take one side or the other. So that's um, that's uh, just one example of ways uh, in, in which, you know, we want to show different aspects of this relationship. Um, and it's kind of it's neat because as the writers come down from the tower of writing, um, is, is, is there an actual tower? Uh, no, okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, it's wonderful. It's uh, fabricated of gold. <laughs> it's good With ivory panels as flower petals trickle, uh, drip, drip, drip down on everyone. I was saying this earlier, you know, the, the, this building is, is too nice for film students because when you get out there, you'll be in like 1920s bungalow or plaster <laughs> falling from the ceiling. So when plaster is falling on your head at you know 11 o'clock at night when you're trying to write a script then you know you've made it <laughs> well so since the casket door has been opened um i just want to congratulate both of you on sort of breaking the so-called moonlighting curse <laughs> um, um, and i 
and I know that there were sort of different sets of opinions about whether or not that was a sort of smart move for the show going forward. So I guess the question for both of you is, how, did you approach this season fundamentally differently? Because you knew you were going to be sort of encountering both sort of a lot of expectations uh, built up over the years from, from people really wanting to see this move forward. And sort of past shows experiences of having kind of a rocky time after they get their two central characters together. To me, it was always part of the same story. You know, inevitably you got into a relationship and, 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 and people were asking, well, when are Castle and Beckett going to be in a relationship? And my answer was always, they already are. They just, they, they may not have slept together, but they were in a relationship. And once they sleep together, that's not going to fundamentally change because they're not going to become different people. They're still complicated. They still drive each other crazy. And that's the fun of the show. And I think putting too much weight on it is where some folks went off the rails. Uh, when I watched Moonlighting, the shows after they got together were very difficult. They were um, off pattern. There was a lot of acrimony. There was no joy in the relationship. And that was certainly something that we had no desire to do. Now, was it the right decision? I, I will say that it was the um, least bad decision, certainly, because <laughs> if we had kept them apart another season, I think we would have strained credibility um, I think we would have frustrated a bunch of people. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been honest. <laughs> you know, and, and, and we want it to be honest and organic. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering on what level, and obviously this, this uh, Final Frontier episode is so much about fandom, fandom within the show and fandom without the show. What, uh, what level of influence does fandom have in terms of maybe directions you take the show, directions you take certain characters, arcs? Is there a relationship? I, you know, I think that our experience with the fans has been wonderful because you guys actually ended up supporting us through, I think, our first, first year, year and a half, and that was tremendous. And actually, when we've done a few of these Comic-Con conventions and engaged with fans, um, it's pretty pretty powerful um, but for me I feel like a lot of this just comes from from Andrew and from the writing staff of course they're aware of fans and their response to it it's almost like doing live theater in a way because you have this immediate response whether it's through Twitter or through blogs now mm -hmm. um, but I think the primary focus is being honest to the characters and um, I think that that's what appeals to fans so it, it generates from this way in that direction you know what I mean? And it's also that we got into the business because we were fans. You know, we had shows that we loved, um, and it made us want to do this. It made us want to tell stories. So, you know, I I know what it's like to dress up as a character from my favorite science fiction show, um, and it, it's something that we want to honor. And, and I see some other shows that they kind of make fun of those characters or belittle those characters, and I, I I don't see why. And whenever we've gone into a subculture, whether it's Comic Con or whether it's steampunk. You know, we've always tried to do it uh, with some sense of honor and grace and uh, poking fun in the right way. Absolutely. I'm also one of those people who dresses up, so I do appreciate it. <laughs> um, How about that last scene, huh? Well, that was fun, right? <laughs> yeah. You've never looked at it. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see what the Tumblr sites do with that. <laughs> I'm sure they're already mentally being produced by some here as we have to sit here. Um, so speaking of both of you sort of bringing your own maybe fan identities to this, um, Sana, I wonder how much you sort of thought about the lineage of female detective characters on television when you were first developing your sort of take on this character, and how much it, either, whether you know Cagney, the Cagney and Lacey's really influenced this in any way, or or sort of how you feel you balance with the expectations of the sort of archetype of a female detective on television with some of the more emotional arcs you've had to do, especially over the last season. Um, you know, when we first started the show, one of the reference points that Andrew gave me was the Thin Man series, mm -hmm. um, which was really informative because I was asking him, what, what's the framework that we're working within? Is it going to be um, a traditional kind of uh, procedural or what kind of fun are we having in here? And that opened it up to something that was more playful. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there, we discovered something in the beginning stages of developing the show and the character, and that was 
that that history that that Andrew and his team had created the the history and the reasons why she became a detective. Um, and so, what was wonderful about this character was I got a chance to play in the comedic world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that happens on set all the time. So. <laughs> what great comic timing! Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, we, got, we got a chance to play in the, the comedic realm, but also kind of balance that out and, and ground it in something that was uh, honest and dramatic mm-hmm. at times. Um, and it's not because of me. I think it's because of, it, it, I know it's because of your writing and because you create that kind of, of female character. You pointed me a lot to Catherine Hepburn, to a lot of these Hoxian dames, Mm -hmm. um, which are very strong uh, female characters that are capable of playing with the boys and still being sensual and and interesting, and they're very compelling, very intelligent. And so um, that was kind of like the model that we went with, and that came across in a lot of the ways that they chose to dress my character since. And also, like, We've even talked about this lately. You said that there's there's a different kind of female now than there was perhaps in the past when you had to create a detective character. We we have the permission to be sensual and feminine and to be complicated and confused and powerful and strong and be an authority and and none of that takes away from the fact that oh this is the detective mm-hmm. you know. And the Lieutenant Chloe speech just sums it all up so beautifully in that episode. Yeah. I actually did get sort of a moment of like, oh. yes, 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 yes. Did you? I, because I loved that I speech. I'm so happy. Thank you. <laughs> And that's a, an example of really great collaboration because Stana pushed us on that speech. You know, she wanted to make sure that it encapsulated um, something that was honest for her character. Uh, it, it, it's interesting, you know, having watched all those screwball comedies, having smart professional women who own their own sexuality in the 20s and 30s and, and part of the 40s, and then for some reason it sort of disappears for a long time. Um, so my models were always that more than Cagney and Lacey, and, and I felt it was important for Becca to be, in a way, post-feminist, where it wasn't an issue that she was a woman in, quote-unquote, a man's world. We'd gotten past that. She was a person doing a job with all the normal stuff anybody would have to deal with. And sure, she comes up against it from time to time, but it's not her primary existence. You know, I think that we live in a world where um, women young girls growing up can decide to be a princess, a warrior, or a princess warrior. You know, they can sort of do anything now. They can be president. That that we shouldn't think in terms of those barriers. And and I very much wanted Becca to be a function of that. Wait, okay. So tell them tell them um tell them Becca's middle name and where it came from. <laughs> it's Houghton and it's from uh Captain Hepper. Which is cool. I thought that was cool. So I, yeah, I think it's interesting you're making all these the cinema references because there's something really, really great about the televisuality of the show in terms of the balance of episodic and serialized elements. But I know you, Andrew, had previous success working in film world with Air Force One and Hollow Man. I'm wondering what it was like to make that transition from cinema to TV, if it was challenging. It's a lot more work. <laughs> TV is, the, the physical labor in TV, you know, I'm lucky if I get five and a half hours of sleep um, a night when we're in, um, when we're up and running, because we start filming in July, and we don't stop. We film every day until uh, late April, basically. Uh, and every eight days, we start a new one. Uh, we finish one, and we start the next one. So the factory line aspect of it and trying to do art under those conditions and trying to tell great stories under those conditions wasn't really what I expected having come from a feature background where I could afford to go to Starbucks for, you know, the morning and try and figure out whether my character says, come on or let's go before the plane blows up. (laughs) So it's just a a different timetable. um, And also on the show, working in producerial capacity, you have uh, post-production duties, you you know, at, at any one time, uh, we have a story that's in concept stage, one at a story arena, one at outline, 
one being written, one in pre-production, one in production, one in post-production. And my day consists of going everywhere and answering questions about all of those and holding all those stories in my head simultaneously. So your brain gets really lit up and it's, it's a phenomenal learning curve. Uh, features was that was a much different learning curve and, and I love being able to paint on that big wide canvas that features afford you uh, to be able to tell stories that um, that really suit that particular medium and this was just a whole different beast um, not to mention ABC's six act structure which does not loan itself particularly well to procedurals mm -hmm. there's that extra act so you're always in the back five what do you do before the commercial break? I know who the killer is, or you know something like this. It's it's, it, it, it's tough. Procedurals really should be told in like a four or five act structure. Um, so it's a real learning experience, and, and I think for for Sana being uh, a, a co-lead on a show like this, I, I don't think that you ever had a workload like this in your life. <laughs> I mean, it's exhausting. I, I mean, you should give Sana a round of applause because she's got to get up in the morning. She has to be in the makeup trailer at 5.30 a.m. So she's, you know, she's, you're going to get Aww. Like, oh. <laughs> this is so fun. I wouldn't miss it. It's great. So uh, the, the difference is being able to have a more engaged conversation with the culture. Like you do a feature, best case scenario, best case, it takes you two years. And in today's climate, what do you get? You kind of get, you kind of get a weekend. That's it. And then the next movie comes out. And television is remarkable in that you can have this sustained conversation with the culture over the course of a couple of years, if you're lucky. Yeah, and so that's been great. Yeah, I mean, speaking of the sort of sustained storytelling style, not just from the seriality of television, but I think one of the most amazing things about the show, and certainly the thing I'm the most, I'm the biggest fan of, is all the sort of transmedia extensions that you've done with the show. Um, yeah, so that's, the that's novels, the graphic aggressive. novels, and even, you know, Richard- Transmedia extensions. Transmedia extensions. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> particular interest. Um, so, I, I, I just want to sort of ask a question about both how you sort of um, conceive of those as part of the broader castle story. So we now have uh, the Nikki Heat novels, and the Dark Storm novels, the Dark Storm graphic novels, and there's obviously kind of like synergistic aims behind all of this partially, but they also have really enriched the stories on the show. And they often sort of, we saw in this episode, you know, it starts out with sort of promoting the new Derek Storm graphic novel. So I wonder how you sort of think of that um, in your various roles as writer and producer and that, and also uh, what, how much you sort of think about that when you're conceiving the character, or yeah, how much you're sort of keeping tabs on that. what Nikki Heat's doing when yeah. you're thinking about what Beckett is doing. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, he is a novelist, so it, 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 it made sense to have him write some novels. Mm -hmm. um, and what was exciting about it was the potential of drawing on the material in the show mm -hmm. and creating a meta experience. Um, being a fan of particular shows, you know, I was always looking for world extension, and this was a way mm -hmm. to do it in this series that was really organic. Um, I think in today's competitive climate, uh, and this is business meets storytelling, that when you get somebody invested in the world, um, it's a smart business decision to build out that world and give them other sandboxes in that world to play in. But for us, it's also just really cool. Mm -hmm. It's really cool that a fictional character that, you know, that, that, that we create is a number one New York Times bestselling author. <laughs> it's cool, it's crazy, you know? So having the opportunities to do that and having the opportunities then to bring it back into storytelling because he's had these experiences and if you guys remember season two, the hot love scene in the book that Beckett was running off to read, yes, to be able to reflect it back um, was, was part of the fun. But what was most important was to do it well, to make sure that the books were written really well by Richard Castle and that it would be a, a true fan experience and not an exploitive one. Because mm -hmm. I think that you know, you all can feel the difference between something that is, is done out of love and done with an eye towards quality and great storytelling and something that's just done as a product to get out of the marketplace. How many of you are students here? Great. <laughs> and, and how many uh, of you flew into town for this? Double great. Thank, thank you for coming to visit. 
just extending on the uh, trans media conversation, I was wondering, the, it seems, and maybe this is just coincidence, but the more it broadens out to more and more forms, be graphic novels, blogs, Twitter feeds, etc., you is it less necessary to incorporate those things in the television shows themselves? I'm just thinking in terms of, like, we used to have the poker games, for example, and now that's less of an issue, maybe because it's less necessary because those worlds are being inhabited elsewhere? It's also really difficult to get all those people in the room at the same time. <laughs> it, it was a miracle we were able to do it, and we had uh, Stephen Campbell, who was a friend of the show, who passed away, and he was always somebody that we could count on to, to bring it in. But, you know, Patterson is pretty busy. Um, you know, uh, Dennis Lehane and Michael Connolly uh, have touring schedules. Michael's up for it. You know, I, I exchanged emails with him uh, a little while ago. He'd love to come back. So it's just finding the right time and opportunity to do it. Because we think it, it, it helps with the storytelling, and it's not something that we want to drop. Um, but that some of that is just a function of what we can do and what we can't do. Um, we're always trying to make sure that the world is coherent, that um, we're keeping it all in mind, and that things reflect back and forth. Um, but we do have limited resources and have to put on a TV show, so sometimes you know the Twitter doesn't get as much attention, and you know sometimes. Um, you know, some things have to be sacrificed just to get stuff out there, but we've tried to keep it pretty consistent. I was very happy to see that Castle survived the superstorm, though. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all agreed the collective yeah. sigh of relief when we found that out on Twitter. So who, who here follows uh, Richard Castle on Twitter, Ryder Castle? Oh, great. Well, I know there's plenty of people here who want to ask questions, I'm sure. Um, but I have an a utterly fanish question that I feel compelled to ask before we go there. Um, and it'll be the last. Um, so we, we have uh, castle dinner parties every week, um, amongst many of the yes, and and no, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And um, and we have developed sort of organically a very scholarly drinking game. Um, <laughs> yo, it's yo, isn't it? Yes. What? Yo, right? Like Esposito's uh, yo. No, we don't. They don't hobby. Oh, no, no, no. When when the word hobby comes out, that's one of yeah, our codes. That's, that's one, one of our codes. codes. Um, but you know, it's it's things like we gotta have the old standbys that we know we can count on. Ryan wears a vest. <laughs> <laughs> that's our that's our stock, you know, good solid standby. Uh, transmedia references are some of the ones that you know, like Alexis Parents Castle, that sort of thing. But Martha drinks. Oh my god, she hasn't recently. Um, so we we started this season and we realized that the drinking game has been foiled a little bit by. <laughs> Beckett getting together, especially because we don't have a really good Beckett rule anymore. We so, used to have innuendo between Castle and Beckett, but now the innuendos are. Realized. No, it was, it was specifically uh, Beckett makes a reference to her sexual past, and Castle does like a goofy reaction. <laughs> Um, so we, we, we still had a couple of those a couple, season, a couple. Right? Yeah, We got okay. a couple in this episode, but we're not drinking here tonight. <laughs> but you will be drinking Monday. We will. We There's will. a lot of material. Uh, transmedia references? Yes, I know. We, it's, like it's probably... Road, it's yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, so we were hoping that we could maybe go to the source and get a really good Beckett drinking game roll. <laughs> How about every time she touches her hair? <laughs> Evidently a problem in editing, okay? Problem for our drinking man. Um, I think if you're a musician, just play your music. You know, if you're an actor, just keep acting. If you're a writer, keep writing. Um, and find different ways of putting you, yourself, your work out there, and find ways of collaborating with really interesting people. I think you have to follow your passion. Um, and uh, keep stimulated, keep engaged, keep learning. People start coming to you, you know, eventually, as, as you and your talent and um, your history start growing. People start coming to you because you're too big. They can't avoid, you know what I mean? They're like, that person is super talented. I can't avoid them. I have to go and see and talk to them. And you have a lot of opportunities now because you have, you know, YouTube. You have a lot of opportunities out there. And so if you can keep staying brave and putting your stuff out there, I think that opportunities will come to you. And um, you got to take your shot. I mean, you get one shot this lifetime. So if that's what you're passionate about, you got to take your shot. So don't worry about your parents. 
If it doesn't work out, there'll be something else that you'll find that you're really passionate about. But if it does work out, how great is that? So take your shot. And um, something that, that you need to know is that when you're working as a professional and you've got the gigs, you're still going to face potential burnout. And you've got to find a way to embrace it. And you've got to find a way to reinvent it. And you've got to find a way to love it, even when it's, it's getting you down. First, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, a, a lot of it comes from my sense of the character. I, I think that there's a little bit of me in the character, so um, aspects of it come naturally. There's in the, Beckett? Yes. <laughs> uh, on the past. Yeah. Um, uh, I think some of it comes out of my relationship with my wife, Terry. <laughs> And um, some of it comes out of the, the writing that I love, the, the 1930s Hoxian stuff, the, the banter. Um, I'm a big fan of subtext. Uh, you know, I like the work of Pinter and uh, David Mamet when it's good. Uh, <laughs> because I think what's unsaid is more powerful than, than what's said. And the first four seasons was about being able to get as much subtext as we could in there without just breaking the audience. Um, you know, it, 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 and now we face a challenge of how to conduct the relationship with different kinds of subtext. Uh, so for me, it was always about pace and wit and, you know, Noel Coward, the, the folks that, that I, I really like. So hopefully that answers your question. I don't know. I just, I just sit from my typewriter and make stuff up. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just hungry and we're doing it. <laughs> we're getting the scene over lunch and I haven't eaten lunch, so I'm just, just going to eat in this scene, okay? <laughs> and Rob's like, no, don't eat in this scene. And I'm like, God, Rob, it's real. It's natural. <laughs> and then Andrew came to me one day and he said, could you just stop eating <laughs> in this scene? And I said, you know what? Brad Pitt eats in every movie he's ever done in the last 10 years. It's real acting. So. So here's, here's, the funny, here's the funny thing about that. I actually don't mind when she eats. I, I, I think it's kind of cool if, if, if the scene is built around it. What drives me crazy is when she chews gum. And here's why, editorially, and, and, and you students who have cut stuff will know this, is that I never saw the gum go in her mouth. <laughs> so suddenly her jaw's just going up and down for no particular reason. And then when I cut to a different angle, it's going up and down at a different speed, so I can't put the two scenes together. <laughs> the, the two pieces of coverage together. Um, but like, if, if there's a source, if they're like sunflower seeds on the table and she's picking them up and putting them in her mouth, it's a lot easier for me to explain it to the audience than just suddenly like, what's wrong with her jaw? <laughs> Anyway, there's going to be a lot less eating. For <laughs> <laughs> a food continuity expert. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, it was really fantastic in the Hamptons episode, um, especially for that, because she's out of the precinct, she's out of some of the confines, so it was actually a really great choice on her part. She seems more relaxed, like a relaxed cat. Yeah. Yeah, so. Embracing her inner barefoot contest. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that, that everybody on our staff has a unique voice, and it helps create a broad tonal range because they all end up being castle shows, and if they're too far out in one direction, we kind of we kind of bring it back in. But some people um, just have more affinity for um, things that deal with relationships. Some people have more of an affinity towards things that deal with uh, the darker cop procedurals. Um, but uh, generally, what we do is is have the folks come in and pitch things that they're excited about. Uh, we find the ideas that seem to fit into what we're doing in the uh, overarching character development and also, okay, we've had a couple funny shows, we need a serious one. Oh, that's a serious one, great, let's put it there. Oh, we've had a serious one, now let's put in a funny one. Um, let's put down a straight down the middle. Oh, we've spent too much money this year, let's do a seven day. So, 
because sometimes that happens. Um, so they pitch it, we work together to develop it. Um, we work in a group to uh, basically break the story in, in acts and scenes on a whiteboard. And then once we feel confident, that writer will go off and write the outline. We'll give notes on the outline, sometimes do a little tweaking and rewriting before it goes to our partners in the 818 over at Studio Network. And then that writer will have a chance to deliver us a draft. And then every time that happens, we are hoping that we get something back that's perfect and shootable. Uh, doesn't always happen. Um, so oftentimes we'll then go through the um, go through the process of notes. Sometimes I'll take a pass at it. Uh, it it's you know the first couple of seasons I, I um, had a heavy hand in every episode, but now we have writers who tend to know the material better. Um, I'm trying not to kill myself, so uh, I'm doing a little less rewriting this year. Sometimes I have to jump in. I have a very good partner, a guy named David Amen, who I split the work with, and uh, and the result ultimately is hopefully something with the original voice of the writer that fits into what we're trying to do in the show in the broader picture. Um, but everything is vetted at every step along the way. We have um, a, a very good working relationship. You know, some folks just say, you know, stand here, say that, and get me home. And other folks are really interested in what's happening next and you know their investment in the material if there's a question on set the writer of that episode is on set and usually they're able to handle it if it's something that's a little bit more complex i'll get a phone call um, and we'll talk it through yeah if it has something to do with the character arc um then oftentimes you resource andrew i'm speaking as one of the actors <laughs> which one <laughs> do you want to do seamus <laughs> Hey, Beckett, so there's been a... Uh, <laughs> I reject it. I reject it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Get this. <laughs> Get this. <laughs> yeah, so for like the character, the character, like season arc stuff, you go to Andrew because Andrew's kind of got his eye on, on that. But um, the writers obviously have a lot of, you know, time in, in the room with Andrew and with the rest of the team. And so they've got they've got a really strong idea about, you know, a lot of the stuff so you know it's a balance between the two right yeah yeah and then you guys give great director notes too yeah yeah we sit down with uh, every director before the episode we walk through the episode with them so that they'll know what our intent is in each of the scenes and then we have some repeat performers that uh, don't need as much hand holding you know somebody like john trelaski who's been with us for 16 episodes or whatever he's been with you know that's yeah, since uh, first season yeah that's, it's, it's an easier conversation with him than somebody who we're bringing on who may be new to the show it's tough it's not an easy show to direct for those of you that are um studying directing it's th there's so many things to have an eye on from the types of i think the camera setup or the camera style that you set up mm -hmm. to the comedy and the subtext and keeping the procedural uh, element believable there's just really a lot to have a handle on and it's not an easy show to direct i think it's a high performer show we've seen some established guys go down in flames um we do 65 setups a day uh generally minimum we're moving at the speed of light and um what was our record 111 setups one day wasn't it yeah, but that was that was Bowman that he had three cameras. And he, was <laughs> he was just showing off. He was just shooting stuff, so he could say that. So. No, no, we we, we we shoot we shoot a lot because we're a clean show, um, so it makes it very hard to hide in the editing room, and you need the coverage. And um, a lot of the subtext and moments, you know, get built in the editing room, so we need to have those options to to make sure that everybody's dialed in. And walking that line between comedy and drama and being able to turn on a dime requires us to, to, to really focus in certain scenes. Um, it's, it's a demanding show, and again, the actors are remarkable. You know, the fact that Sonic can come in and has, you know, two pages of that dialogue in the interrogation room, and then an emotional scene right after it, and then, you know, uh, a run and jump right after that, and this is after, you know, having, you know, five hours of sleep and coming in and memorizing all those pages and being able to lock in. You know, these guys do a remarkable job every day. Sure. <laughs> no, we, 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 
we're always looking for moments to to reveal different aspects of Beckett. We kept her, we played her pretty close to the vest for four years because the show was, the entry point was from Cass's point of view. And I think this season, what we've aspired to is starting to peel back those layers in a way that we never were able to have access to before, which is storytelling that we're really excited about. So, you know, um, opening, opening those doors and looking inside those closets, yeah, I, that'll be fun to us. She just wants to get on a motorcycle. <laughs> No, no, answer the question. I cut you off. <laughs> no, of course, you know, I, I would love to continue to, to play with this character and open up all of that. And I really do want to get on top of a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs>
I'd say it's a collaboration. <laughs> no, you know, um, there are times when we find it fun to acknowledge the meta universe, and certainly in this episode, um, it was uh, an obvious thing to do. Uh, and we know that uh, the Firefly plan, the Firefly fans, and you know, enjoy that. So. Uh, we've done it purposefully on a number of occasions, certainly starting with the Halloween episode in season two where we put them in the brown coat. Um, and and there have been moments uh, all the way through. We don't want to uh, ever get too heavy with it, but I think it's fun to acknowledge, um, as, as fans ourselves, you know, uh, a portion of his life where, you know, remarkable work was being done that got overlooked. Yeah, um, so I have this uh, project, this initiative that I started two years ago. It's called the Alternative Travel Project. <laughs> and um, when we first started it, Andrew got a phone call from someone saying that I was going to ride my bike to Long Beach on a day of filming. And <laughs> what? Well, that's a what? <laughs> she gonna die. <laughs> We were a little concerned. It was, it was probably misadvertised to us the way the information came across. But. but what happened was there was a conversation after that where I said, well, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm really dedicated to. What I'd like to do is, it's a global initiative, and the idea behind it is to get people out of the bubble of their car and traveling in different ways, whether it's through new technology or by public transit or just walking and cycling. And so Andrew had a really great story about your experience when you first moved to LA and lived without a car for a hot second. Uh, it's not that great a story. Well. I was, I was, I was a screenwriter taking meetings. I didn't have a car. So like I was, I was taking the bus everywhere, which um, was a, a little frustrating to me because uh, you'd either get there an hour early or twenty minutes late. And there was this one day I was pitching over at Fox. Is this the story you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. And I swear to God, I didn't know how to get on the lot without a car. There was like no pedestrian entrance. I couldn't. Find, so I, I, I literally waited behind another car, in the car <laughs> so I could walk to the guard gate and get my pass. And I think it's at that point that you realize mm, this town wasn't really built for alternative forms of transportation. Isn't it, isn't it a shame? Um, because, you know, I went to school in New York and, and you took the subway everywhere and uh, grew up in D.C. They had uh, the metro. I, I ride my bikes everywhere, my bike everywhere because it was really friendly. Um, and L.A. made it challenging and, and thankfully they're making it less challenging. And so when I said this was something that I wanted to do and I wanted to encourage, especially in L.A., because L.A. is so car-centric, Andrew um, was very supportive and um, shared that bit of his history. So, yes. I, did, I just didn't want her bicycling down the long beach. <laughs> I mean, it was a night shoot. Is she crazy? A little. Um, yeah, so there will be other chapters, and I, I love hearing from people across the globe. We, we keep hearing from stories. But, from, but it's a great point. You should, you should go film in France, and then Spain, and then... You should just, you should just do that. Why, why would you go to Europe and, and film there? Um, yeah, well, they're, they're, yeah. they're a wonderful that story coming nice. from over there coming here. <laughs> no, oh, I didn't have, get to go to Long Beach. She had a bike down to Long Beach, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or maybe she didn't, didn't tell me. Um, well, you know, uh, for the character Beckett, it was important that she had a, a sense of authority. And one of the things that I learned early on in working in Los Angeles, and I had a really wonderful director. I, had, I was on Heroes. There was a show Heroes for like a hot second. Yeah. <clears throat> I was on it for a hot second. Heroes. <laughs> uh, it, it, it fell apart after you left. I, I <laughs> maybe it was timing. Maybe it was. And. Um, they saved the cheerleader and saved the world. One of the things that the director said uh, was common for 
people, younger people, was that we finish our, our sentences in an upward inflection. So we, so I wanted to go over there. I, I wanted to see, so how are you doing? Yeah, and I was going to go over there, and my friends were saying no, and we were talking about, you know, so, and, and that actually diminishes authority. And they, of course, this character is an authority figure, and so she, as a woman, would have to go downwards and end on a period. She has to have declarative sentences. And something that the guys really want, because naturally I have like a real kind of sing songy voice. Um, they want my voice to be, of course, lower, sitting in a lower register, and to have a little bit more uh, steadiness in order to communicate and sell that authority. So, you know, I mean, there's a bit of psychology that any um, character's vocals, um, and I think that this, th this is some of the psychology behind Beckett, you know? What do you think, Andrew? Uh, I, I'm a big believer in people's vocal quality determining how they are accepted by the people that they talk to. Um, and we, we worked on, on Beckett uh, specifically in that area so she could come in and own a room just by how she presented herself and how she talked. Now Sana, but you know, she's sort of avoiding a question, she loves talking in accents. <laughs> she does, on set it's, it's a way to relax, it's a way for her to break out. <laughs> Playing, playing Beckett's difficult, you know, when, because Stana is not contained and Beckett has to be very contained, so it's, I think it's tough for her to spend 12 hours doing that. Do you remember on the pilot? No, what? <laughs> on, on the pilot? The balcony? Yeah. 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 We were shooting late, and we were shooting late, everybody was tired, and we had this scene to do, and, and everybody was sort of learning their lines, and Stana took everybody out on the balcony, and they started doing their lines in different accents, and she insisted on having this do it in different accents. And it was it was one of those moments where you're like, I'm, I'm watching something that's just magical. It's, it's gonna be one of those moments that, that, that lasts with me. Yeah. Uh, it was just, it was great. It, it was fun, it was playful. It was a spirit of camaraderie when everybody was tired. And it was her, you know, picking up some folks on, on her back and finding a way to turn it into play. It was really amazing to watch. So you like the uh, Russian gambling scene? I love the Russian gambling <laughs> because we know how hard it is to be exposed in front of that many people. And, and you know, what's important to the process in directing is always creating a space in which the actors can do their best work. So it's something that we try to do, and the director, you know, normally speaks in a quiet tone, and, you know, what do you need? Do you want to go again? Uh, what do you need in a situation like that when you're having to act that vulnerable and that exposed? Yeah, I do. I think I need... Um you just need to not notice that everyone else is there. So keeping the set quiet and the assistant director of, often helps with that and just keeps everyone, you know, moving around and um, less distracting. Um, and then, you know, of course, great communication with the other actor, great communication with the director and writer because 
if there is a shift in the scene, then we just need to be on the same page, I think, at the top of the scene in order to make it make sense and easier to shift around. Um, but I think, you know, that that's it. And they do a really wonderful job on the show of being respectful to the actors. Um, it's fa fabulous. It's quite a family, honestly, in the behind the scenes of it. And then in a scene like that, it's, you know, for Sana accessing an emotional, an emotional moment can help guide her performance, like a time when she was really sad. I think she was thinking about the time I told her she couldn't chew gum. <laughs> you know, it's just, just, it just, just came out that way. Very moving. <laughs> Sorry, I was back there for a second. <laughs>
truly wonderful to work with someone who's crazy intelligent and really just like a genuinely lovely guy. So um, thank you, thank you for bringing me here. And I, I wanted to pass that on to you guys um, because that makes it wonderful to come to work daily. Now here I thought I was the lucky one getting to work with her. Uh, on behalf of our drinking game, please keep Ryan in the vest. <laughs> and, uh, also, and, uh, yeah, any Ryan Espo romance moments also very cool. <laughs> you got some stuff coming up. Um, <laughs> send us uh, send us a cheat sheet so we can write the episode where you guys get really drunk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It's so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming.